DNA is the ultimate technology that moves at the speed of light if you convert it into a digital signal and send it. That's why I'm so passionate about its use in space. Hey, Ron, what's up? Hey, Carl. There's lots going on all around the world. How are you? Good. I'm glad that we're settling back into a rhythm. You're in India. I was in Paris. And now we've been hard at it. No travel for a little bit. There's a lot going on. Yeah, we're not going to be physically traveling, but we will be virtually traveling because there's a lot going on all around the world when it comes to biotech. And you shared some news with me about a biotech initiative in Saudi Arabia and that they're getting on board and they are starting to see the value of biomanufacturing to be able to produce products locally rather than relying on imports. So that's really exciting. I'm very interested to dig more into how they're approaching this national biotech initiative and what are some of the first items on their list. Yeah, this was in the news last Thursday. So it's late January and Saudi Arabia was in the news because they said they were launching a national biotechnology strategy with the goal of being the biotech leader in the Middle East and North Africa by 2030 and really with the hopes of becoming a global international biotech hub by 2040. It's hard to imagine what biotech is going to look like that far in the future, even though it's only less than 20 years away. So they're going to continue to build on their strengths, which means a lot of money and a commitment and a lot of education. I think we know a fair number of Saudi Arabian biotech, either students or entrepreneurs here in the United States. And I'm sure that other people who see the opportunity would be interested in going or putting a facility over in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and I think the, one of the big things, and I'll say one of the criticisms oftentimes of Saudi and actually other initiatives in the Middle East when it comes to the United Arab Emirates is they have really big initiatives. They put a lot of money in, but sometimes those initiatives, they're not as successful as anticipated. So I'm thinking of this Abu Dhabi initiative called Mazdar City, which is a pretty cool layout. I mean, they claim to have self-driving cars, but they're actually cars on tracks. They weren't self-driving it looked beautiful, but it was fairly empty. I did go there like on a Saturday, but it made it seem like it was a bustling city with lots of people living there. And there really wasn't. Saudi Arabia has an initiative of the line, the Gnome project. That's fairly new. So it remains to be seen if that will be bustling. But there's been a couple other things. When I went to India, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a photographer, and he was asked to take photos of this school that was built is actually in a desert area in India. And there were a lot of experts from all around the world that were coming to make this beautiful, sustainable school that was not really close to a lot of villages, but it was this big PR stunt and it was built and all this money was poured into it. And all the people came from all over the world to see it when it first launched, but they didn't have any of the local kids attend. They actually got children to act and pretend that they're going to the school for photo opportunities, but nothing actually transpired. So it's like a ghost school now. No one attends it because it's just far enough that's hard for people to commute there. There was no other infrastructure busing to go to the school. So anyway, I'm digressing, but it's just for these big initiatives that happen in places that maybe aren't densely populated, how are you going to get people to go there and live there and enjoy what is being built? I'm fascinated by this idea of the line. I'd like to know more about the way it's being constructed because, I mean, in an ideal world, everything would be produced locally on site. So you would grow the concrete, you would grow the infrastructure, you wouldn't need to be importing iron or concrete from other places. But it does seem to be advancing pretty quickly. And I get what you're saying about these big national initiatives, but still props to Saudi Arabia for setting in place a national bioeconomy initiative and claiming that they're going to become a regional hub by 2040. I think biotech is going to be for sure the most important technology along with AI as we move further into the century. At the same time, our friends at Symbio Africa announced that they're doing their second annual event. Last year, it was held in Uganda. This year, it's going to be held in Nairobi, Kenya. As we get more information on that, we'll share it. And I think what we should try to do is get Jeffrey O team to come on and talk about what's going on in Africa. We did end up meeting a lot of people from South Africa when we were at Symbio Beta last year. But there is a lot of stuff going on domestically, which is typically what we're working on. But I think it's fascinating to see what's happening around the world 
And given that this is a global industry, there's a lot of people working in it. I think it's important for us to just highlight the fact that there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of people using these technologies and a lot of people want to make the world a better place using biotechnology. Yeah. And again, oftentimes biotech was associated with biopharma. And here on this podcast, we talk about how biotech is changing every industry. It's blossoming in different parts of the world because we are here in New York City. It is its own biotech hub here. And there's a lot of programs, labs, incubators, accelerators. And we're lucky to be a part of that community. One of the events that startups to attend is SynBioBeta. SynBioBeta is an amazing conference. We talked about it last year because I attended. You've been going for quite some time, Carl, since the beginning, right? I think I've been going since the second SynBioBeta, maybe in 2013 or 2014. So this would be my, let's just say, 10 years of attending with maybe one year not going. And of course, then during the pandemic. But during the pandemic, John, the organizer, held a lot of virtual events. And I think I participated in most of those. And it was a great way to keep the community together. Sometimes you had 100 people on a Zoom that wanted to see each other because we were so used to seeing each other physically, whether in San Francisco or more recently in Oakland. So it is a very tight-knit community. It's a growing community. And pretty much anybody who's involved in synthetic biology probably knows about SynBioBeta. Yeah, it's highly recommended that you attend SynBioBeta because you will have an unfair advantage. You will have met a lot of people that think like you that might have solved problems that you are facing right now. So you don't have to maybe spend a lot of time trying to figure that out, but just ask your fellow business professionals. It's a great way to network, great way to learn maybe other industries that you could explore if the one that you're working in might not be the right product market fit. Maybe there's another market that you could go to. And SynBioBeta does a great job of showcasing all of the, the different technologies Technologies that are out there to really help grow the bioeconomy, all thanks to our guest today, John Cumbers. So John is a longtime friend. As I mentioned, I did meet him at the Symbio Beta Conference and we became friends. He would eventually ask me if I wanted to co-author What's Your Bio Strategy, which we did and we published back in 2017, which seems like a really long time ago. But John also previously had worked at NASA, which we'll talk about and has some really exciting new things happening. So I think this is gonna be a great conversation with John Cumbers, who has an extensive network across synthetic biology and biotech around the world and is an inspiration to us all. We also have a special offer for our listeners from SymbioBeta. If you wanna hear that, stay tuned until the end, but let's get the pod started. Well, John Cumbers, welcome back to the Grow Everything podcast. You are our second repeat guest. I'm so proud to have you back on again. I'm really looking forward to catching up with you, hearing what's going on and hearing what you're looking forward to this year. Thank you, Carl. Always a pleasure to be on your podcast. It's my highlight of the year. Well, thank you. Now, John, we're recording this at the beginning of January 2024. I was hoping you might give a quick reflection of your thoughts on 2023. What stands out for you in terms of the progress that we've seen in synthetic biology? Well, I got to say, thank goodness for the government, because the private investment sector is still in a whole world of pain. Now, you could say that the government is causing that with their high interest rates. You could also say that the government saved us all through COVID. So I'm glad that there's a strategic initiative in the US to support the bioeconomy and decarbonize our manufacturing industries, renature our manufacturing industries using biology and biotechnology. And we're starting to see that happening all around the world with countries like the UK and Singapore and India, all thinking about developing a bioeconomy strategy or all have developed bioeconomy strategy. So I think this is the year where private investment feels the squeeze. We can talk a little bit about our upcoming investment report at SynBioBeta, which we're going to be having a webinar on in about 30 days time to talk about those numbers. But in general, yeah, it's been a painful year for the industry. We saw Amaris go under and close their doors, which many of us were very, very sad about. So many products out to market, so much potential, so much scale up. And one of the early what we thought was going to be a success story only to end in bankruptcy. So it's been a mixed year, but I'd say we're hanging on in there, Carl. 
Yeah, but I mean, you say that, and I know it was tough for a lot of people. And on the biopharma side, people are talking about continued pain. Though, on the other hand, I have had people say to me, this is going to be a really good year for small to mid cap biopharma companies. But we did end the year with two big acquisitions. Our friend at K18 Hair were purchased by Unilever Prestige. And then Ambrix Biopharma was bought by Johnson & Johnson for $2 billion. What do you think those acquisitions mean for synthetic biology? It's very interesting to have those two big acquisitions pop. And K18 would have been a big one. And for those of you who don't know, it's a biological peptide that's designed to bind with your hair and it strengthens the hair and it prevents it from drying out. So it's a really cool example of the bioeconomy in health and beauty. But the even cooler thing is it's got revenue, baby. And that's what we want. And that's what Unilever saw in the acquisition of it. They're just going great guns. If anybody's on TikTok, you'll have seen the K18 hair flip and my daughter uses it. My wife uses it. It's just a screaming success story in the consumer business. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And what do you make of the Ambrex acquisition? Because Ambrex is essentially a synthetic biology company. Yeah, it's, Ambrex is interesting. We've tried to engage with them and I've invited the CEO and the founder. And even though they're a synthetic biology company, they're doing non-natural amino acids, which is super interesting work, making these proteins that can't be found in nature because you're putting in these amino acids that don't exist in nature, but have been engineered. And they're using it for making drugs. There's a whole bunch of biopharma companies who are singularly focused on what they're doing and good for them. The two billion exit without my help. So that's fine. John, you are also a very big voice, not only in Zimbabwe, but on LinkedIn. And recently you shared a post about the funding opportunity for solutions for deep space missions known as Trish. And you have a background. I mean, you worked at NASA, isn't that right? That's right. Yeah, I was at NASA. I helped to start the synthetic biology program there. So I'm very passionate whenever I hear anything about space and biology. And this new Trish program, which is all about space health and bench to space flight, is another example of really cool stuff coming at the intersection of space and biology. Iram is a huge space fan, and she should keep asking these questions because I'm super interested And we're going to have some space people on the pod in the next couple months. But Iram, tell John your interest and and keep asking the questions about it. The first time I really got that light bulb or like the fascination was when I attended Biofabricate in 2022. And they had a design agency where they were making bricks out of mycelium. They were very strong and they're doing all of these experiments. They were funded by NASA to explore these lightweight materials that were super strong. And then, of course, when it came to television shows, one of my favorites is For All Mankind. I don't know if you had a chance to watch that. I know you're super busy. No, I don't know it. It's amazing. It's about four seasons at this point, and it is an alternative world where after we landed on the moon, we continued space exploration. We continued the spirit of competition, and they then start colonizing Mars. And it's just beautifully made by the Apple production team. They don't really talk about biology as much, which I think is always missing when there's space movies or television, I think, except for The Martian. That had more biology in space. But it's interesting to learn how you're constrained by these parameters. You're in space. Sometimes you're in microgravity. What types of SynBio applications excite you? What excited you when you were working at NASA to see what type of research was coming out and would enable deep space missions? It was an interesting story about how I ended up at NASA, because if you're familiar with Tim O'Reilly from O'Reilly Media, he runs a conference every year at Google called SciFu. I heard about this session that happened at SciFu, which had Pete Warden, the director of NASA Ames, Larry Page, the then CEO of Google, and a couple of other big names in space and tech. Oh, Drew Endy was there. Drew Endy, one of the founders of the field of synthetic biology. And they had a breakout session on how to terraform an asteroid. I was chatting with Drew and Drew was bragging about this session that he'd been at with Larry Page and Pete Warden and how they're going to terraform an asteroid. Pam Silver was there as well, I remember now. And I thought that is my dream. And for those of you who know me, since 2003, I've had this dream of living forever and going and settling the solar system. So this was now 2005, I think, when Drew told me this. And I was working on aging. I've had two academic streams of interest. One is aging and longevity and insulin signaling. And the other one is space and terraforming and microbes and extremophiles. So I was knee deep in longevity research. 
But I thought, well, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. What if I spend my whole life studying how to live longer and then I die? Right. I thought, man, that would suck completely because you'd have missed out on all these other cool things that you could have done. So I thought I wanted to put my eggs in more than one basket and I want to start exploring space as well. So I pinged Drew and I asked him for an intro to Pete Warden at NASA. I emailed Pete Warden. I remember very clearly it was a Saturday morning and Pete replied right away. I was asking him for funding for my PhD, my graduate student work. And Pete replied right away and said, yes, let's do it. I want to see that happen. Can you come to NASA and start working here? It's really weird because these days I don't do cold emails. I always try to go through a warm connection, but man, sometimes cold emails work. And that was the biggest significant thing in my life. Brought me to California, got a job at NASA, stayed there for seven years, and then left and started Synbio Beta. Started it a couple of years before I left actually as a side gig, and then it grew into my full-time job. So yeah, I have been passionate about engineering microbes for space. But in answer to your question, the thing that I'm really excited about is that biology solves the mass problem. The mass problem being that it still costs $25,000 a kilogram, plus or minus, to send anything into space, water, food, materials, drugs, people. SpaceX is bringing that cost down, and that's great. That's happening right now. But we're going to have to make things there. So we had a few mantras in NASA. One of them was, don't take it, make it. So this whole idea of ISRU or in-situ resource utilization, or a term that we coined BISRU, BISRU, biological in-situ resource utilization, was all about how can you get microbes to make food? How can you get them to purify water? How can you get them to make biomaterials in space so that we have all the things that we need there and we don't need to take it with us? And now imagine that you've got a reprogrammable microbe. So you can be up there on Mars and you can be sucking in CO2 from the atmosphere and you can be now making food. But now you don't need to make food. You've got enough food, so you need to make some medicine. So you can just reprogram that microbe to take the CO2 and convert it into medicine. DNA is the ultimate technology that moves at the speed of light if you convert it into a digital signal and send it. That's why I'm so passionate about its use in space. Now, Iram, I don't think knows this, but I do, and our listeners won't know this, but John, you have a plan to actually hold SymbioBeta on the moon in 2030. It's not SymbioBeta, it's a sister event called Beta Space. And if you go to beta.space, you will see the event that we did in the Mojave Desert in 2019 with SpaceX and NASA and Blue Origin and a whole bunch of synthetic biology startups, entrepreneurs, and investors. And it was on the front page of the LA Times. And that's the event that we're going to take to the moon in 2030. But if 2030 is too late for you, and by the way, you can go on Eventbrite and buy a ticket right now. There's the early bird that ends in 2025. That's next year. But if that's too late for you, last Symbio Beta, we had three astronauts come speak about the intersection of biology and technology. And this year we have a whole track at the conference, which is May 6th through 9th at the San Jose Convention Center, all about space synthetic biology. So we're cultivating a community of people and geeks who are passionate about the intersection of space and biology and who want to see humanity thrive and spread throughout the universe. Yeah, sign me up. Sign me up. I'll be there for sure. Deal. (laughs) So, you know, we've been talking about space as this intersection of space and biology And I think it's a fantastic example of the reach of the applications of biology and sin bio writ large. But as you think about other areas where biology is being applied in new applications, what's got you excited right now? You get the front row to everything, John. So what has you excited? There are a few different application areas that have me excited. One is just the appearance of designers coming into our field. I was in Paris for iGEM. I recently joined the board of the iGEM Foundation. They have their annual meeting in Paris. And I took the opportunity to go visit Neoplants in Paris. And I think you know Patrick Torby, one of the founders of Neoplants. And they've engineered this indoor house plant that is going to suck out pollutants from the air. It's a beautiful application. They did, I think, an Indiegogo campaign. You can go buy one of these things. What struck me was the elegance of the founders in terms of very design-oriented founders 
thinking through the use case, thinking through the marketing, thinking through the branding. They've already got a product that's actually working and sucking out these volatiles from the air. So it's just a really beautiful example, which for the last 20 years, we've all been dreaming of these kinds of companies. And now they're starting to appear and they're not these real deep tech. I mean, it's good technology. They've got great scientists there, but they're not leading with that. They're leading with the design. That's one thing that I'm super excited about is the new era of bio companies that are leading with design. What I would add to that is I think the last session at Biofabricate in Paris just a couple of weeks ago on the last panel, it was Suzanne Lee, the founder, Amy Cognon, and I can't remember who the fourth person was, but our friend Andy Bass of Ecovative was on stage as well. One of the things they said that they had surprised them was also that the profile of the CEOs of the companies that they were seeing at Biofabricate were less the scientists and more designers who are being able to use the technology without necessarily having to dig into it in a way that us geeks and scientists would, but being able to use the technology as an, an enabling tool to create a product that solves a very specific problem in the marketplace. I agree. The plants that were designed, did they actually make the plants or was it just more of a theory? Yeah, they're in the office. You can go see them. And what type of volatiles are they sucking out there? It's a good question. I can't remember, but if you go on the website, you can see. And did they engineer the plant that way or did they do? They okay. have. They have yeah. to engineer it. Yeah. Because yeah. we've been seeing a lot of high throughput mutagenesis to get around the genetic modification of plants because of regulations. So I was always curious to see other approaches to biotechnology that's not necessarily engineering when you're using like CRISPR or chopping things up and moving it around. You're actually coaxing it to have different biological properties. So that's really interesting. And then I know that there's another company that does the bioluminescent plants and they're trying to come up and sell it in the e-commerce way where you can just click, click, click and get a bioluminescent plant at your house, which I think is really cool. That's right. That's light bio that's doing that. And I think all of these have their regulatory issues, their country specific issues. But yeah, if you go on the website, you can see how both of those companies are developing and the kinds of products that they're putting out. Yeah, what's interesting, I pulled up the website. It says the air in your home is up to five times more polluted than outdoor air. This is due to a specific class of indoor pollutants called volatile organic compounds, which includes some of the most carcinogenic molecules on the planet. So they don't specify there what those are. I mean, I think we'd maybe have to dig in a little bit more, but I love this idea of just general plants in your house are great, but being able to pull these volatiles from the air, I'm fascinated by that because who would know that your house is five times more polluted than the outside? You'd think it'd be the opposite. Right, absolutely. I think one of the other areas that I'm particularly excited about is decentralized science. We had a whole track on this Last year, we gave one of our Symbio Beta Awards to Paul Colhas, who's the CEO and the founder of Molecule. There are a number of these interesting DAOs sprouting up, distributed autonomous organizations. One of them is Valley DAO, which is a synthetic biology DAO that I'm an advisor to. Another one is Athena DAO, which is looking at women's health. Another one is Hair DAO, that's looking at male pattern baldness. Another one is Vita DAO, which is looking at longevity. This intersection of decentralized science and the way that it can use blockchain to distribute the value of the research that's done at the early stage of a project and value the research, value the publication of the research, value the peer review of the research, and then value the investors and create a return for investors that are putting money in. So I think it's the future everything is going to be turned into a DAO at some point in the future, including our democracy, which I'm very passionate about as well. It's like everybody's using CRISPR. CRISPR started 12 years ago. Now everybody's using it. We don't really talk about it anymore. I think it's going to be the same for DSI. Everything's going to become decentralized. But I love when you find these niche communities. And that's what I think we're really good at at Symbi Beta is finding these new niche communities and then promoting them and growing them. And so this is one of those that I'm very excited about. And John, on that same topic, after we had interviewed you, you held an event in Montenegro, which brought together some of the most impressive thinkers in Synbio and blockchain. And I seem to remember Drew was in conversation with Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum. But the concept was based on this decentralized state. What should our listeners know? 
They should know that the next 50 years is going to see a whole lot of turmoil in terms of nation states, and there's going to be a whole lot of disruption, probably some pain, but out of it is going to grow a beautiful new period of enlightenment. And it's going to be led by science and technology, and it's going to be distributed in a much more decentralized way than our current power structures. Hi, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Messaging Lab, the force multiplier for biotech. Your biotech company is making the world a better place. You know that, we know that. But does the world There's a big reason why some biotech companies attract investors, sign up customers, and get attention. That reason is strategic communications. At Messaging Lab, we translate complex science and economics into compelling narratives. And we have done that for the most successful biotech companies across healthcare, agriculture, personal care and beauty, materials, and the list goes on. We're here to make sure your ideas not only get heard, but resonate with your audience. So if it's time to amplify your company's voice, visit messaginglab.com to explore how we can elevate your story and grow your business. That's a very beautiful vision. I hope that is what unravels. We have talked to a few DAOs and we talked about a little bit in earlier episodes, but I know you've been keeping your finger on the pulse of these communities. But of the DAOs, which one has the largest community versus which one has made the most impact? Because I know that most of them are fairly new, but any progress on size and impact of the DAOs? Certainly in the DeSci space, Vita DAO is the biggest. I'm not sure the market cap these days, crypto is going up again, but it was at one point, I think $60 million in the purse that they could then allocate to different resources. I spoke with Michael Buran from Pfizer who spoke at our conference last year. I saw him at JP Morgan this year. He said that the fun really starts happening when one of these research projects hits, it works. It's an asset, for example, that's then sold, that then creates millions of dollars that then is put back into the purse and gets to be redistributed. He said that's when the fun really starts because... Pfizer has invested in VitaDAO. They put in, I think, a quarter of a million dollars, maybe half a million dollars, something like that. And there are other pharma companies interested as well. It's legit. Pfizer wouldn't be dumping in money in a snake oil. So there's definitely a there there. And as Michael says, once that flywheel turns, it's really going to kick in. And that's when the fun starts. Awesome. Well, I guess half a million dollars for Pfizer is petty cash for one of their departments. So it's not super big, but it's something. They have the reputation on the line. It's more about the bureaucracy and the paperwork needed to do that than about (laughs) the amount itself. I don't think people understand how complicated drug development is. And given how complicated it is, it's the reason why there is no trillion dollar Pfizer or trillion dollar drug company. There are several pharmaceutical companies that are worth $100 billion, but none of them have approached the trillion dollar valuation that is what the fangs are, the Facebook, the Apple, the Amazon. Now, NVIDIA has joined that group, Google. So I think it's interesting to speculate what that's going to look like. What does it take for a pharmaceutical company or biopharma to become a trillion dollar company? There's a new name for the fangs now. I can't remember what it is. It's a different acronym now that NVIDIA is in it. Yeah. And then it's not Facebook, it's Meta. So it's something else. Do You were at JP Morgan, but did you happen to see the NVIDIA talk? I didn't go to the conference this year. I was just hanging around like a lot of other people in the periphery. Yeah. I mean, there's always lots of activity in the periphery and oftentimes more fun. You get a lot of insights that aren't squeaky clean. And just for the mass industry, you'd probably find out more information, more secrets. Any secrets revealed at JPM? I don't know, but I'd agree with you that the periphery is better than the actual conference. That's why I wasn't that excited (laughs) to go this year. It's full of suits. The lunch really sucked. The first year I went, that was last year, I queued up to try to see Jamie Dimon and then they closed the doors super early. So it was a disappointment. But yeah, I prefer going to events on the periphery. I attended a wonderful reception at 50 Years. They did a DCI reception with Molecule. So that was where I was chatting with Paul Kohlhaas and Michael Baran. I also attended the Nucleate party. That was good. That's a student group that's doing some great stuff. And we've got a partnership with them to bring a bunch of students to Sin Bio Beta this year. 
It was just good to catch up with people. I mean, there's just a lot of folks there. Jason Whitmire from Blue Yard had a little Airbnb that they were hosting people at. So in general, it was just good to catch up with everybody. Let's talk about Symbio Beta this year. You mentioned that there's a hot crypto person that might be joining the stage. I don't know if you can reveal that yet, but what are some things that we can anticipate for Symbio Beta this year? Well, I can give you a sneak peek around one particular VIP and their partner who is going to be doing a fireside chat. And this is at the intersection of AI and biology. This isn't public yet. It's not coming out until next week. But Stephen Wolfram is going to be speaking with us. So he's the founder of Wolfram Alpha, founder of Mathematica. He's really excited about biology. And so he's going to be doing a fireside chat with Stephen Quake. And if you follow the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Biohub, Steve Quake was the founder and the chief scientist of that organization. So Priscilla Chan, Mark Zuckerberg have a vision to cure all diseases. They're putting a ton of their philanthropic dollars into this Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. And Steve Quake leads it. And Steve Quake just announced this giant new computer cluster full of NVIDIA chips that they're going to use to create an AI model of the cell. So both of them are going to be on the stage talking about that. I think about 50% of the talks at Symbi Beta this year are going to have some AI component in it. It's just crazy how everybody is just looking at this as a new tool and not trying to understand how they're going to use it. Yeah, there was a lot discussed last year. So there's gonna be a lot more this year, sounds like. But it'd be nice to have like an AI map. And where is it successful in the grand scheme of biology or biotech development? Is it protein engineering? Where is AI really succeeding today? Where does it need more support? I will tell you, I went to this party this past weekend and a gentleman who works at Microsoft was there and I told him, oh yeah, I work in the biotech space. His eyes just lit up and he was like, oh, you work in biotech? That's such a hot area. So for all the big companies that are developing AI, they're just so interested in biology because it's real impact. And we've had Microsoft, we've had Google, we've had NVIDIA all come to Symbio Beta over the last few years. They've all been sniffing around the edges. But yeah, Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA, is super excited about it. Bill Gates has been investing in it for a number of years. So there's definitely a ton of tech founders who've been putting money into biology and are very excited about the intersection of AI and bio. So that's one of the hot areas. Very interestingly, two of our big keynote speakers that came last year, Paul Stamets from Fungi Perfecti and Michael Medica is coming back and Martin Rothblatt from United Therapeutics is coming back. These are the kind of level of people that I would only dream of getting to speak. Well, they had such an amazing time last year. They asked me, hey, can we come back? And they're going to do a fireside chat interviewing each other. So I'm very excited. I mean, Martin and Paul were both just phenomenal guests last year. Craig Venter just agreed that he's going to come back and talk about his new book, all about sequencing the oceans as well. So we've definitely got some old faces and some new faces. Sangyap Lee is another of our keynotes. He's a big name in the global industrial biotech ecosystem in terms of chemicals and materials. He's based in Korea, so he's going to be coming over and giving one of the keynote talks. And then Probably my favorite speaker of all is Drew Berry, who is a molecular animator. And if you looked on YouTube for videos about the central dogma, you'll just see these beautiful, beautiful animations that Drew Berry has done over the years. And so he's flying in from Australia to talk all about the intersection of biology and animation. That's going to be a big highlight. Wow. That's neat. Yeah. I mean, so much to unpack there. I have something that I really want to talk about because when I went to Symbio Beta last year, I had a chance to talk with Paul Stamets a few times, which is what you can do when you go to Symbio Beta is talk to you, all these amazing people. And I actually spoke to him before he went on stage. I was like, oh, how's it going? Are you excited? And he was like, yeah. He's like, isn't it interesting, this word of synthetic biology, this term? I was like, yeah, it is a little strange because here at Messenger Lab, we're always trying to communicate biotech to the mainstream, to customers. And the word synthetic and biology almost contradict each other. I wanted to talk to you, and Carl's like, this is going to be very controversial for John to talk about, but the term synthetic biology, is it something we need to keep? There's a way to describe it to make it more appealing because I know Paul Sammons was like, just call it bio beta. <laughs> Remember he said that on stage? He's like, just call it bio beta. So what are your thoughts about the term? Do we need to have a brand facelift for it? 
It's a great question and it's something that comes up a lot. I think that the name is good for what it does, which is to focus conversation and resources around making biology easier to engineer. Understanding that we want to make biology an engineering discipline and it's not an engineering discipline. And in order to get it to be an engineering discipline, we need to focus on investing at that level to make it one. I don't believe that the name fits once you've got a product and you're trying to get it out to the market. Nobody wants to wear synthetic biology. Nobody wants to eat synthetic biology. So I don't have a problem with that. You can use the name when it suits you. We know what it means, the synthetic biology community, the synthetic biology industry. We know what we're doing. We know the mission that we're on and why we're here. As these products get to market, they're bio-based, they're bioengineered, they're whatever you want to call them. They're sustainable. Or you just lead with the qualities of the product and you don't need to talk about the technology that was used to develop it. Yeah. I mean, there is for us, some of the consumer biotech companies, whether they're in food or beauty and personal care, the labeling comes into question. So it's like, what has to be on the label because of the way that's produced, or maybe it actually has some terms we use as microflora, like rather than bacteria. But the biggest thing I think when it comes to some friction is when it's the label, the ingredient label. Yeah. And my friend, Carl Handelsman, who I think you both know, has said, label it, label everything GMO and minds will be numb to it as they are numb to the cancer labels warning you in California that this building has been built with something that has formaldehyde in it or something like that. The levels are not significant enough for a health effect. And likewise, the GMOs are not a health concern to people. So therefore, label them and people will stop worrying about them. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the consumer acceptance of GMOs has increased tremendously, but you still have very strong voices out there who are against it. There was an entrepreneur who I think I saw on Twitter, and she was making a point of what the next couple of decades were going to look like and made a comment about the meat is all going to be fake. And so I said something like, yeah, it's not going to be fake. It's going to be cell-based solar agriculture. It's going to be more nutritious. It's going to have less of an impact on the environment. It's going to be more tasty. But people like that, they don't know how to react to us when we say things like that, because we clearly understand where we're going and we're creating this future. And I think it's fine for there to be people who like question and want to be, let them be anti-GMO, let them be we only want organic without really understanding that organic does use pesticides. It's just a different kind of pesticides. But I think there is a level of, of education that's necessary. And most consumers just want a product that works. I agree. I think a lot of it too, a lot of the fear of GMOs comes from the fear that it's bad for your body, that there's something nefarious happening, especially when it comes to thinking of pathogens and how it could affect your health. And recently, you actually posted about the U.S. National Security Commission on Emerging Biotech. Can you tell us a little bit about what stood out in that report and what does that mean for the bioeconomy and actually just for consumers as well? Yeah, happy to. And this is an important report because the committee was set up by the Senate to look on the emerging biotechnology market. What is happening with these technologies? How is the US preparing itself? How are we looking at our competitiveness against China and against other nations? I think the most significant thing is who's on this committee. So there are 12 commissioners. Jason Kelly, our good friend, the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, is the chair of it. Michelle Rosso is the vice chair of it. Both of those people were at Symbiobeta last year. So we did a whole breakout session on this Senate committee. And it's then got Senator Alex Padilla from California, Senator Todd Young, who I think is from Ohio, Representative Stephanie Bice and then Representative Rokana from Silicon Valley here. And then it's got some other luminaries like Angela Belcher, the scientist from MIT, Eric Schmidt, founder and previous CEO of Google. So it's really a very impactful high-level committee. What they're trying to do is to make sure that US doesn't get caught off guard. And it's a real sense that We've been caught off guard on semiconductors, on 5G technology, and that China is really good at central planning of their economy and being like, that's the area we're going to go after. And they've pointed at DNA reading, DNA writing, DNA editing, and they're like, gung-ho, this is what we're going to do. If you go buy a piece of DNA right now, you're probably buying it from a Chinese company. That's the cheapest out there right now. They have a large share of the global market. 
the report talks about stopping playing defensive and starting playing offensive in terms of our economic strategy. And it also talks about legislation that they're proposing that you can go and download this report and look in some of the details around it. So I think it's a really good sign for the US in terms of national competitiveness. It also talks about bioliteracy, which I think is a really important topic, which it says the majority of people in the US can't tell you how a gene relates to a protein. And that if we want a workforce that's able to adapt to the next hundred years of biology, these are the kinds of things that we need to be investing in. Yeah, I think that's super interesting, John. And I know that you're a global traveler. You've been all over the world. You did a couple of events in China many years ago. What do you see as being a competitive advantage that we have over, say, a China who has this centralized planning and investment happening? And I hate to say, what's our advantage, U.S. versus China? I think we have a planet of people that cooperate with each other, scientists cooperate with each other regularly. But from that kind of industrial point of view, where's the U.S. advantage? It's a really good question. I used to say that it was in the entrepreneurial drive of the economy. However, I don't believe that is a slam dunk anymore because some of the Chinese entrepreneurs that I meet, two of the three founders of Alurius are a company that's like Ginkgo Bioworks, but they're based in China. They were at Symbio Beta this year. They were one of our exhibitors. They are just some of the most creative entrepreneurial people that I've ever met. And I look at them and there's so much passion and excitement in their eyes for what they're doing. One of them gave me as a gift this year, a Lego pipette to give to my daughter. And he just made it and boxed it and has a website where he's selling these Legos. It's that kind of let's just do it attitude, which Silicon Valley is full of that kind of attitude. That's why I love living here in the Bay Area, because it's got that culture to it. And I think Shenzhen has that culture to it. I think Suzhou near Shanghai has that culture to it for the bio entrepreneurs. But it's not a slam dunk that that's a differentiating factor anymore between the two economies. I haven't really come up with a new thing that says this is where America is going to be able to compete. I'm an American citizen now, born in the UK, and I get it. I get the sense of freedom and rights and individualism that this country has. Only in America, and he wasn't born here, but Elon Musk, that kind of person who's like, I'm going to think big, I'm going to think differently. Steve Jobs... Bill Gates. I mean, that is American dynamism, is the technology, starting a company, investment, capital markets, the greatest capital markets in the world. Now, having said that, I haven't been to China in four years. So it's going to be really interesting to go back there. One of our sponsors just invited me to give a keynote at their talk, TJX Bio. They're a competitor to Sartorius making fermentation equipment. And they just invited me to speak. I can't make it, unfortunately, but I am itching to go back to China and do an event there and see what is going on in the world. A Rum just came back from India where she did a bit of a biotech tour as well. I don't know, Iram, do you want to give John your 10,000 foot view of India and what you saw and John, your take on that? I didn't see as many biotech companies as I would like to because it was a family vacation. So I couldn't just be out the whole time. But of the founders that I spoke with, they were early stage founders. They had laboratories, but they didn't have it as zooped up as, say, like Alexandria Center. They didn't have all the full automation, the new bells and whistles and new bioreactors. They didn't have all of that. But they also are democracy. And one insight that was really interesting that they were talking about is that, look, both in India and the U.S., you have private companies that are trying to make it, trying to get some money and support from the government. And and it's just hard to rally the troops. It's hard to get all everyone aligned. And like you're saying in China, they just have the initiative, all the money's going to where it needs to go. There's no debate on what needs to happen because there's clarity. And then there's the five-year plan. They have those resources. They have the money. Pretty much, there's like no other thing you need. I mean, obviously you need the vision, you need the technical know-how. I think all those countries have all those types of people, but it's the money, it's a government, it's a regulation. How do you incentivize all of these entrepreneurs How do you take the roadblocks out of their way? When the biotech founders in India and the biotech founders here in the U.S. kind of commiserated on that. They need some more resources and they're just not necessarily getting them. And which city were you in? Bangalore. Oh, 
I'm surprised because Bangalore is the biotech hub of India. So I'm surprised to hear you say that it wasn't more developed. I haven't been to Bangalore. I've been to a number of other cities in India and we might be doing an event there next year. Oh, it's developed in terms of there's a lot of biotech hubs, no, at least six on top of my head that's in Bangalore. They just aren't building a bioreactor. They import that stuff. They import the latest and greatest. They don't have the infrastructure that we have access to here in the US and maybe even China is years ahead of us when it comes to biotech. But you should definitely go to Bangalore and I'll hook you up with some people there. <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, what this conversation reminds me of, and John, you did, I think, the first Africa Symbio conference last year, and it just reminds me of something that we say a lot. It's biotech innovation can come from anywhere. It's the ability to engineer biology is democratized. The tools you need are becoming very accessible. And so we can see innovation coming from places that we might not expect it. I'm expecting to see some tremendous innovation come out of Africa, come out of South America, places that we wouldn't normally think of it. You've got the entrepreneurs, you've got the technology, and they're going to be solving problems that are very real for them that in turn we can learn from. I agree. There's a lot of interesting things happening all around the world in terms of innovation and the intersection of biology and technology and new companies starting and new investors popping in and supporting these companies. So it's a very exciting time to be in biology. Yeah, I mean, I think I was saying to Iram the other day, it's like, look, we're very lucky to be part of this community because we know people everywhere. I think the only places where I feel like I'm under indexed when it comes to people in Symbio is Central Asia. I know an investor from Kazakhstan, but I don't know anybody who actually is on the ground doing Symbio there. Just like I don't know anybody in Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan, those places. I'm sure they're there. We'd like to have them reach out to us, reach out to John for Symbio Beta because we want global coverage. Yeah, Symbio Beta Tashkent, I think, has a good ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does. So in our last interview, we asked you a question. And we asked, if you were to start a biotech company today, what would it be and why? And you said, if you remember, is an oral microbiome company where you could create a pill or some type of mouthwash that would enable self-cleaning of your teeth. So if we were to give you $50 million today, would that still be the company you would start? Or would there be something else based on what you've learned over the year? I just found out about a company called Lantern Bio here in the Bay Area that is doing exactly what I wanted to do. It is engineered microbes to break down plaque in your teeth. And you can find out about them. They're going to be at Symbi Beta this year. Lantern Bio, Aaron and Leonid are two of the founders. They're doing it. They're taking some tech that came out of a university in Florida and they've licensed it and it works. So I'm pretty excited about that company. So I definitely wouldn't do that one. What I would do is actually, and I can break this, you're the first to hear about it. I just incorporated a new company this week. We just signed the paperwork on it. And it is called Biological Enlightenment Studios. And we are making a Pixar style animated short that is going to popularize molecular biology. Excellent. Oh, wow. So if you think about the Senate report that we just talked about, they talked about the need for bioliteracy. Well, one in a hundred people could tell you how a gene relates to a protein, but after they've watched my animated short, that's going to go to 80 out of a hundred people. It's going to be the next Pixar animation studios. You heard it here first, and I'm very, very excited about it. Congratulations. That's great news. Thank you. That's awesome. That fits perfectly with the Pixar Disney trope. I forget all the names of these, but there was one about mental health and there was a character for each mood. Oh, yeah. Inside out. Yeah. Yeah. Inside out. Yeah. But there could be a character for each part of the central dogma. Who's the DNA? <laughs> My gears are turning because this is such a cool idea. And congratulations. This is awesome. Thank you. And Inside Out 2 is coming out this year in the summer. We're already excited to watch it. It's one of my favorite movies. I don't watch a lot of movies. I've watched Inside Out maybe 10 times. It's wow. phenomenal. And I have nine-year-old and 12-year-old kids. So we've got a big TV now that we watch a lot of these kind of movies on. But they all get it wrong. I was watching one with Will Smith in it a couple of days ago, and they were talking about genome engineering. And he said, well, I engineered it with a CRISPR case nine. Right. And I was like, oh, oh, so close. Cringe. Yeah, exactly. Of course, Cringe. it's Cas9. But yeah, it was super awkward. So they always get it wrong because the scientists get pushed out and the story people get pushed in. Well, not in my animation studios. Right. 
And if people want to know about it, they can sign up to my newsletter at symbiobeta.com. We haven't announced it yet, but we will do. And I'm hoping to show the first two minutes of animation at Symbiobeta on the stage in May. Amazing. Oh, wow. Wow. You're busy. And we'll put all this in the show notes as well so people can just click and sign up. And I want to offer your listeners a $300 discount code. They can just type in grow everything at the page to sign up and they'll get $300 off the ticket. So uh, we'd love to see as many as your people as possible. Fantastic. I mean, it's hard to believe, but we are in the 60s now in terms of episodes. We're pushing almost 20,000 downloads at this point and good feedback from the people that are listening, which we really appreciate. So it's great to have you on again. We consider you to be a Grow Everything regular and want to see you back here again soon. Awesome. Well, it's always a pleasure to come on. And I appreciate all that you're doing to help promote the industry and also promote Symbio Beta. We get a ton of people come in because you talk about the conference. So can't wait to see you both there. Yeah, we'll see you Absolutely. soon. Absolutely. Iram, what did you think? You've known John for a while, but you had never attended Symbiobeta until last year. What was your impression of the interview and what was your impression of Symbiobeta? John is just a fun person to speak with. Not only is he funny, he has a different perspective on things, but he's also very knowledgeable. It's just great to talk to him because he sees everything that's going on in Symbio, biotech, even in what's going on in different government initiatives because he is involved. So he's a wealth of information and a joy to speak with. And I just really commend him for sticking to Symbio Beta and being devoted to developing this community. It makes our jobs easier because we meet all these fascinating people when we attend Symbio Beta. Yeah, absolutely. John's a great person and he has created this tremendous network. I've heard someone say that the reason why synthetic biology is as successful as it is in the United States is because of John. And had he stayed in the UK, for example, the UK would be a much bigger powerhouse when it comes to synthetic biology. Not that they're in any way slackers. We do see a lot of very interesting companies coming from England, and we hear about new ones starting up all the time. So I'm very excited for that. But I love being around John. He's very inspirational, and he's a great person to know. I love the fact that when I brought up the oral microbiome company, because I was just curious to see if that was still on his mind and how funny is it that there is a company that is out there focusing on the oral microbiome and they're coming to Symbio Beta. If you dream it, it will happen. Wouldn't it be awesome if that company had listened to our episode and was like, that's a cool idea. Based on all of our research, we could do something like that. Let's just start it. Right. If you've started a company based on something you've heard on Grow Everything, please let us know. We definitely would love some founder shares. <laughs> That's the dream. Ideas are very easy to come by, hard to execute. So the company will have their name in the show notes. It's escaping me right now. And we'll keep tabs on them. When we see them as in Biobeta this year, we will definitely talk to them, interview them and see what they're up to. Oral microbiome. That's awesome. I also love the fact that John started an animation studio to help explain biology better. I mean, come on, Carl, for us, this is what we do. We do messaging, which we help companies with that messaging when it comes to what to say. But the visualization part, to be able to create a cartoon and help people, but younger people think about biology earlier, it's going to be fascinating. So I can't wait to see this animation that John and his team will be creating and what it looks like. He has, I think, high standards based on the animations that he has seen before. And I know that he's going to strive to do better. So I can't wait to see what that looks like. And we will definitely talk about it. We will link to it. I'm just excited about biotech animations. Yeah, we need a lot more of that. I mean, we're lucky in that we know a good amount of people like our friend in Poland, Frank Metzl, who's an animator. We've also got a friend who's an animator who works out of Argentina. The other really great vision of synthetic biology is by Vantage Films which you can find on Vimeo. But I'm super excited to see what John and his team come up with. I think having that Pixar aesthetic and doing something that is much more storytelling will do a lot to get kids interested in this industry. In addition, we should have our friend Ashman Topman Grant on here because he is developing a video game that is about biotechnology. And I think that that's a fascinating thing to be doing. Yes. Yeah. Those are amazing forms of engaging communications, I'd say. So the more we can have that, the better. 
Yeah. And I think it's worth saying, okay, so we're going to attend Symbio Beta in May. I just came back from Biofabricate, which I've written a couple of blog posts on LinkedIn. And our friends at Polybion, who we featured very early in the Grow Everything podcast, just appeared in a article in Vogue UK that asks the question, would you wear bacteria-grown leather? And it looks like Ghani, which is a fashion brand, is coming out with a line, so commercially available line, of products that are going to be produced using Polybion's bacteria-grown leather, which is known as psyllium. So I'm super excited about that. I expect that the guys from Polybion will be at Symbio Beta this year and probably will have some really interesting developments to show us. And I think we should also get them back here on the pod. Yeah, absolutely. And those of you that are sold on Symbio Beta because we did mention it a few times and of course, being able to be in the community that John created, speaking with him because he's very approachable when you're at Symbio Beta, we have a special promo code. It's Grow Everything for $300 off of the Symbio Beta ticket. It's worth it, especially if you're a biotech founder, especially if your heart is set on joining this industry, or maybe you're still questioning it. It's good to go learn what's going on. And if it's for you, it's great. If not, at least you learned and you could just move on to another industry. (laughs) But it is definitely worth going to. It's fascinating. So please join, use the Grow Everything promo code to get your tickets for Cinebio Beta this year. And then we also wanted to comment on a review that we got on Apple. So if you listen to Grow Everything and you enjoy this podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe. And if you really want to do us a solid, write us a review. So we just got this review from Sheldon1818, and they say, Carl and Iram interview inspiring biotech leaders offering key solutions for human and planetary health so deeply needed today to help provide clean tech solutions and public education that they make accessible for a grab and go approach for responsible daily living and impact. So thank you, Sheldon1818, for that very thoughtful review. I really appreciate it. Yes, awesome. And I can't wait to read more reviews. We will read it on air. So tell us what's on your mind. Tell us if this podcast has helped you think differently, maybe provided you an idea for your company or your day-to-day work, or maybe you have a crazy startup idea that you just want to share, and maybe there is a company that's building it. So this is a great way to start a conversation, just to write a review, and as Carl said, do us a solid. Yeah, so we also, as we've mentioned before, we do have a hotline. If you have a question for us, if you have a suggestion for a guest, or if you want to make a comment without writing the comment, you can always call the hotline. The number's in the show notes. And also now the show notes are a lot more extensive if you're listening to this podcast on Apple, because Apple is providing full transcripts of every podcast that is published on the Apple podcast network. That's very exciting. I will have to check it out because I know that transcription can be an issue, especially when you're talking technical terms or names. And I know that when we get our transcripts, sometimes we have to rewrite a fair amount just because we do have some technical language that gets used here on Grow Everything. But please do use the hotline and leave us a message. Yeah, I wonder if they got my name right. (laughs) So if they get my name right, oh my God, I'd be so happy. But if they didn't, it's okay. AI is still far away from where it needs to be. Anyway. I'm trying to think of like (laughs) how many times I've corrected Iram over the last 60 episodes because Descript doesn't get it right ever. I know. I know. It's the bane of my existence living in a Western world, but we're all globalizing. So it's going to be. It's going to get better. I'll be okay. All right. (laughs) Well, I think that's the pod. Yes, absolutely. Stay tuned and we'll talk to you later.